to WOL Radio. God bless you. God bless you. Hey, man. After what you just finished having, you should shut down for 30 minutes. <laughs> and, and digest you, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, see, what happened is, and those of you that's listening, let me just say we thank and praise God uh, for you, Carl, and Kathy, in a show like this. Uh, it ain't no accident that you have stuff on your show that NBC, or you may see them spend millions of dollars for research. Uh, they don't want it. They can't have it. Because when you hear Trump blame the reporters, it's not the reporters, it's the people that own it. Huh? If Kathy said, look, we don't want to do this advertisement on the show, you don't do it. Huh? It ain't got nothing to do with freedom of this. She owns it. And so that's what that's what we're looking at. And so when you think about what you just heard, uh, that's what's happening in Silicon Valley. And most of them white folks go out there, they ain't got no money. And in two months, two years, they're billionaires. Huh? They're indigo children. This is new group of children that can hit the planet. They start coming in 19. And those of you that want to, Check it out. I don't mean check it out negatively. I mean, just check it out. Just punch up Google the indigo children and the ones that's born in black parents. Most of them, a lot of them, end up dead because the mothers and fathers uh, don't believe you children should talk like that. They born with IQs of 200. They travel to other planets every night. And this is the new thing. Y'all sitting around talking about the church and God is two different things. The church didn't make the moon or the sun or the stars, okay? The same universe that made me and you made the moon and the sun and the stars. And so consequently, uh, that, that universal force said, okay, ain't nobody changing nothing. I'm going to send this group here to change it. We were sitting here, to heal the plant, we joined it. Oh, we drink just as much whiskey as Hitler and them thugs. We drink just as much stuff. Whatever Ronald uh, Trump do, many of us do, okay? We eat the way he eats. We do the things that he We got secrets uh, that violate the universe. We've been taught that. So if my mama taught me that this violation, and I go through, so what you just heard, is this new group that didn't hit the planet. And they don't need all kind of stuff. The, 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 the seven wonders of the world. They was here before Harvard, Yale, okay, London School of Economics. They was here before that. But when these thugs on the planet want to impress people, the seven wonders of the world is stuff that humans made. How come the star? The, the, the sun, the moon. Do you know if the sun lasted one tenth billion of a second? Twelve noon. Hear me now. If twelve noon lasted one tenth billion of a second, everything on this planet would burn up. Okay? Everything on this planet would burn up. And when we sit and we look, huh? They know what they're doing. They do research. We sit around and talk. I, I listen to folk come on the show and talk about what we're going to do. You're going to do nothing. Where's the money for research? Huh? America's the greatest country in the world because they have ways and means. They have people studying the project. You know, if we looked at the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and understood what he was saying at the time he was saying it, you know what's fixing to happen. You know what food you're supposed to eat and all of that. But he just can't come out and say it. So when you talk about how to eat to live, go back and read it. Go back and read it. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, on the on the uh, the basketball playoff last month, when that black man's wife said the games was fixed, ain't nobody listened to her but had a white boy say it at that NBC. Huh? That's all we've been talking about. So y'all play games? What you tell? All right, oh, Greg. Greg, yes. since you mentioned Elijah Muhammad, he he says he was a Gaviite, and today's a Gavi's birthday. Can you help us figure out how? Because it wasn't just straight out that they try to take him down. They had some people who looked like us who, who were working against well, him. Well, they do that. They do that every day. But listen, let me tell you, 
You see, the things that few people talk about Garvey, Garvey raised more money than anybody in the history of America that wasn't doing it through the stock market, okay? Did you hear what I just said? That's what they was, and the reason they didn't kill him, because the love that people had for him, they were scared. So they set up a black woman in New York, uh, uh, Queen Mother Moore, okay, set him up. And back then, the segregation was so rigid that the, the, the black... Greg, Greg, hold that, hold that thought right there, because I know a lot of people need, know Queen Mother Moore uh, in New York City. 800-450-7876. We're talking about Marcus Garvey. We're going to talk about uh, Milwaukee. Also, Dr. Sabius, we always Dick Gregory. We'll take your calls next on 1450. W-O-L, where information is power. And then Keith is in with his folks. Our guest is Dick Gregory. We're going to get into uh, Milwaukee. Also going to talk about uh, Dr. Sabi, the death of Dr. Sabi. Right now we're talking about Marcus Garvey. I guarantee you're going to hear some stuff that you've never heard before. So call up a couple of your friends and tell them to tune us in at 1450 WOL if they're in the DMV area or WOL DC News if they're listening to us around the world. Greg, I'm going to let you continue. Uh, you, talk, you were talking about Queen Mother Moore out of New York City. Uh, how, did she, what, how did she get into a Garvey's, uh, Garvey's group? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, let me just throw that piece out one more time, and then we'll move into that. When the Elijah Muhammad, when he put out the book, How to Eat to Live. Now, let me tell you what happened. There are black folks in my family, many of them are dead now. They wouldn't be nothing but a Baptist. Huh? They wouldn't give a of losing me like the time of the day, okay, in no shape, form, or fashion. Here's what this man did. And it's kind of interesting because if white folks don't tell us, huh, we seem not to know it. There's not been another group of people in modern times that changed the diet because another religious person told them to, huh? The Baptist Church ain't never told me to stop eating pork chops. Here's a man that most black folks wouldn't have nothing to do. The white folks and scared us about them back then. And he came out, and I saw black folks, man, not eating no pork. They gave up their religion. They wear the same cross, go to church the same way. Now think about what we just said, man. Religion is so ingrown, especially the ones the white folks tampered with, huh? And they changed. There wasn't no debate about it. Oh, I wouldn't eat none of that pork if I was you, boy. And yet the man don't get no credit for it. The religion don't get no credit for it because he's black. And white folks ain't said, let me tell you what this brother did. Now, the reason I'm saying that, so... If you go back and listen to the stuff he's been saying, you figure out what's fixing to come down. Now let's look at the minister. And I hear people come on the show, something we got to do. Let me tell you something. And if he would have been white, we would know this. Minister Farrakhan calls for a million man march, okay? And it was 1,900,000 black men. Didn't, they didn't have women. Huh? It would have been women, ain't no telling, three million. But let me tell you something. We sit around and believe that as people start coming, when the unions have a march, uh, they spend $4 per person. So if they bring a million, they've allocated $400 million. When this brother bought 1.9 million people, it cost him $3.50 per person. But since NBC didn't tell you that, you don't know what happened. So now we sit down and talk, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Where's the money? Huh? If you inherited McDonald's as a black, just the boxes and the containers that you have to spend for, we ain't talking about the food around the world would be millions of dollars. The warehouse where you keep it in so y'all can sit and talk all that talk you want to talk about what you're going to do 
as how you're going to do it. You're not going to do nothing until the money is there. Nobody just, call. do you know, this might be an unfair question, do you know how much it costs to check out an ad on your show? No, I don't, unfortunately. Could, could you guess? Just, just, just a guess. Uh, well, for regular show, for a while, uh, you know, back then, uh, was three fifty uh, for a sixty second spot commercial. Three hundred fifty, right? Uh huh. For okay, one. So now, what I'm saying is, do you know the value of you? Do you know what it would cost if you had to pay to get on a show, to have a show to give off this information? Okay, so we get it for free. It ain't nothing free. Okay, that's what I'm saying. But we want to sit by and listen to a show and hear people talking when they go to Egypt and all of that. You think they'll protect them for free when they come back here and tell you what happened and where they was in Africa and all of that? You think that's free? No. But we sit and want to put something together with the mightiest, filthiest nation in the history of the planet. So when you think about what, what what happened, and we don't even think to say thanks. We don't think to say thanks to Kathy. We don't think to say thanks to Stevie. The people who put all them pieces together, it cost money. The payroll. So now when you looked at Martha's Garvey, you know, it was a kindness. It was a love. It was a sweetness that I hear people talk about, you know, what, what, what happened in and the Bahamas and in and, and the Caribbean first. The reason black folks from the Caribbean can come here and do much better because they saw black folks in charge. They didn't run nothing, but that's how clever the British was. You saw black folks in charge. Why? The British been dealing with black folks for a thousand years before there was slavery, okay? When you hear white folks say, why why you Negroes speak such bad English and you're going to get embarrassed? I tell them, hey, because I learned my English from you. Let me tell you, black, but when you come over here, you wasn't speaking English. You speaking African, Swahili. So just stop a minute and say, if I wasn't speaking English, how'd I learn it? I learned it from that redneck cracker, no English speaking white boy. Boy, go over yonder and get that bell cop and bring it over yonder. Now go to England and be around them white folks that had people speaking the Queen's language. They talk just like her. So y'all so busy to get angry and mad about something when all you got to do is use the sense of the universal God. So again, I'm saying what you heard on this show before we came on, that's, that's, that's the universe. That's the whole piece. And you can't hide from them. I've got 13 grandchildren. I know eight of them are Indigo children, and the reason I don't know the others are because I don't have the wisdom in the, to figure out. I hear them saying things. I've got a little granddaughter coming to me, she said, Granddad, is God smart? And, and I said, yeah, he's supposed to be, or she's supposed to be. She said, well, how come he sent his son down here to die for our sins when all he had to do was kill the devil? That's these children. Now you got a bunch of ignorant folks that's so. Uh, and Greg, Greg, let me interrupt you. What did you tell her? What uh, was your answer? Well, see, I know who they are. Now go back to the first question that I said. I said, "Is God smart?" I said, "Well, they say He is, huh? Because I know she's coming with something else." Huh? <laughs> and she said, "Now just think about that, Carl. There's <laughs> one devil that's making us do all the craziness." If you're going to send somebody down to die, to be killed, why not kill the devil? That's where they come from. Now, a lot of black folks hear that, and that's why I said earlier, most of them, a lot of them children die, because black folks hear that, and they get scared, so they take them to doctors, and they get on ribbon. Okay? They don't know how to deal with a child. Well, my grandson created a company when he was five years old. So one day I'm walking down the street and I see this ad on the, the, the buses in Washington, D.C. And I see him going to my son's office and I said, man, I saw a little child on the bus, an uh, ad on the bus look, look just like grandson. He said, that is him. I said, come on, man. 
He said, come on, man. He's had that company since he's five years old. And where did he get the money? Listen to this. He hacked into his dad's banking account. Okay? Uh, at at five, five years, years old. old. And then so then when I see him, I said, man, I got to talk to you. And I talked to him. And I said, you know what? Ah, he didn't miss it. Okay? And I said, yeah, I gave it back to him. I put it back in two years ago. He missed it. Well, that's these youngsters coming here. Okay? And they don't need none of y'all to do a damn thing for them. Like the sun don't need you to come up in the morning. So y'all can sit back with that old crazy stuff that white folks tampered with. Huh? And they come here with the, the pure thing. And I am just fortunate enough to have one of my grandchildren send a letter to the old redneck white boy that's the Secretary of Education in Florida. And when my son told me, he said, man, I'm going to show you this letter the Secretary sent him back. And he said, I've been in, 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 in uh, uh, education for 70 years. I've never seen anything like this. And you're just seven years old? He says, well, if you ever need me for anything, here's my home number, my office number, and my cell phone number. Did you hear me? Wow. And then I called the, one of the fine minds on the planet. And I told him, I said, well, let me tell you something. And I had hair He said, well, that's the indical children, huh? That's the indical children. I said, wow. Now, uh, let, me, let me get back. So he said, she said to me, is, Dad, is God smart enough for you supposed to be? I said, well, 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 well. It, it, how come he didn't? Killed the devil and sent his son. Somebody got to die for he sent his son here to die. Why not just kill the devil? And I said, well, you know, you know, if you would have been around then and mentioned it, maybe God, well, I didn't know what to say. Me and my wife, and then we get to New York, me and my wife and my daughter and one well, of my grandsons, we was in the car. Now, I heard them whispering about him that he had some kind of mental problem. <laughs> Well, I knew I was born crazy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so so we in the car. Uh, I tell you what, hang on a sec, Greg. We gotta take this quick break, folks. You can, and during the break, you can Google Indigo Children, I N D I G O, and you understand what Dick Greg was talking about. Eight hundred four five zero seventy eight seventy six to join the discussion. Take your calls next on fourteen fifty W O L, where information is power. And thanks for staying with us, folks. I guess it's social activist Dick Gregory. We're going to get to Dr. Sabi's death and also what's going on in Milwaukee. And also uh, Marcus Garvey's birthday today. Let's go back to Greg and turn around the Indigo children. And so those are the, pe the people who you told to Google that. The reason this is important because it's very important that black folks understand this so you don't be sending them to doctors thinking they're crazy because they said something that upset your ignorance. My mama told me that Santa Claus was a white boy, and she was buying the toys, okay? That's what raised me, okay? So some way when y'all sit around and think all this old crazy stuff and, and this and that, and then this young group come, okay? The Lord's Prayer, our Father. Well, wait a minute. Who told you God was a man? Now, here's this, 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 this force that made the moon, the sun, the stars, every fly, every bug. He made everything that's invisible, okay, germs and everything. He never told us that, so then he yelled down here and said, I made men. Let me tell you something. Long before there was men, there wasn't nothing on this planet but women. And one day when y'all have some time, look up the Morphodite gods, okay, male and female. You see it in the Bible where it talk about he, him, male and female. But y'all listen to what this white boy done changed, and you don't know nothing. I'm going to say this again. Men wasn't needed to create another God. So anyway, I'm in the car, and uh, my wife is sitting in front of me in the front seat. My daughter is driving. Her son is sitting next to me in the back seat. So he said, Granddad, Granddad, you hear that train? And, and so I know he's an indigo. They don't know. And I said, I, 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 I don't know. I thought I heard something. And he says, Granddad, oh, Granddad, it's about 170 miles from here. 
and somebody ought to stop him. He's doing 50 miles over the speed limit. You hear what I'm saying? Huh? And so I said, and, and, and so we said, and so now uh, he said, it'll be, it'll be passing here. About an hour later, here come this train. Boom. Okay? And I told my daughter, pull over and let's go to this restaurant over here. And I get there. And I tell them, do not mess with him no more. Okay? Y'all do y'all deal with me. Okay? All right? Do not mess with him no more. You heard what he said. Huh? You heard it and you saw the train pass. That's who they are, Cole. And I don't know how we got into this. But black folks need to hear this, this, this. They look like they've been here before. They'll say things that don't mean nothing to you, okay? But I just thank you. I, I had no idea we would even talk about And one day we'll talk, Carl, and I'll have you talk to my uh, my old, my, my youngest son, Johansson, and then talk to his son who opened up this company when he's five years old. It's doing like $31,000 a week now, okay? Wow. All right. And he gives it away. And when you hear him talk and, say, and talk about that, and finally before we go, they had a family reunion uh, on my wife's side. And so his daddy, you know, put everything together on our side. So let me tell you, man, I've been married to this black woman 56 years. And I didn't know what I'm fixing to tell you, and she didn't either. I just knew her daddy was a preacher in a little town called Willard, Ohio. I knew that. And he had the biggest church there, and they didn't want for nothing. Huh? Then all at once, my son, Johansson, going into Cleveland with the family union, he go in and says, well, now, uh, let me show you uh, who this family is. And he said, first, Lillian, which is his mother, my wife. Um, she and my dad been married 56 years. She said, and her father, uh, he went to Tuskegee. I never knew that. Finished Tuskegee, okay? Then he went to theology school. I never knew none of that. He never told me. And then the railroad come to Baltimore, Ohio. Uh, that was the new thing, the Baltimore and Ohio, B and O. And the black folks was gambling and cussing and shooting and fighting. They had some money for the thing. So the owner of the railroad, billionaire, came to town and said, I mean, they, they used to call Willard, Ohio, little Chicago. He came to town and he met with Lil's father and said, here's what we need to do or, or it's going to affect my man. The town, Willard, is named after the owner of the, the B&O. Okay. He picked him and said, here's what we want to do. I'd like to build you a church, and I'd like to send you over around the state and give you the money to build churches. Well, you hear what I'm just saying? Okay? Now, my, my son dug all that up and put it together. Okay? And so now when you stop and think about, you know, things that they take up that need you, not to listen to nothing, they just move and do it. And so, again, I just said to thank you, Carl, that this can get on the show for black folks to hear, not from a black man. And when you Google it, it comes from a white person, and a whole lot of you will believe it then, okay? And so that the, the, the young lady and the, the, those was talking a little while ago, if mm -hmm. you do anything possible to go see that and just listen to them. So now we go back to New York. We were talking about Marcus Garvey and Queen Mother Moore. Now, one of the sad things, a person that I trusted so much, man, I made him take my children to Africa. <laughs> Y'all think I've been black all along? Let me tell you, one of them was seven, another one was five. You know what they told me? 
We don't want to go to Africa to eat us. Oh, God, Jesus. I didn't believe that come out of my child. Hmm? Did you hear what I just said, Carl? Uh, did you hear Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, That's not surprising, though, back then, but go ahead. No, no, no. It surprised me. <laughs> you know, so here's how I dealt with it. I said, well, uh, that's no problem if you don't go to, well, go to Africa. You can't go to Disneyland, huh? And so they went to Africa only so they could go to Disneyland. <laughs> After they came back from Africa, they never wanted to go to Disneyland again. You hear me? Now, the brother that put this together, uh, uh, when I told him the story, I'm fixing to tell y'all, oh, man, he couldn't believe it. I mean, what's wrong with you Negroes because somebody you like, somebody you trust with a bunch of crap, and then when you find it out, oh, oh you get so upset. You know, well, what do you think about me? See, thank God, the black folks that I come up with, in Chicago when I wanted to be a comic. Uh, they came and listened to me when I wasn't funny. When they got through listening to me, I was so funny. And I don't have to be validated by the top 100 funny comics. And at one time, I was the number one comic alive on the planet. Okay? I don't have to be validated by no white folks or no black folks. And so all it was, they pushed me downtown where it cost so much they couldn't even afford to come see me. That's why I'm listed in the phone book. That's why I don't have no bodyguard. That's why I give my money to the movement. We talk about the, the three civil well, rights. Greg, let me, let me interrupt and ask you this then. Because you, you were the top comic at the top of your game, and you left it all for the movement. How, how did you reconcile that? How do you tell your I family? Have to reconcile. Let me tell you how I re You're right. You're right. I'm sorry. Here's how I reconcile. Okay. <laughs> I was in the military, right? I wasn't married, and there wasn't a war going on, right? And I didn't have no children. But had I been married and had some children, when I was in the military, it was racist. So a white racist, Negro hating cracker, who was the captain that told us what to do. And had there been a war going on, and this ignorant, nasty white boy said, take that hill, I'd have ran up the hill. Mm -hmm. Now, can I do that for black folks? Huh? If I'm going to do this for a red neck, Negro hating white boy that wouldn't give me the time of the day, am I willing to do it for black folks? Okay? That was that simple. That's how I figured it out. And when I got married to Bill, I said, look, baby, uh, I won't be home much because liberation is not in our house. And liberation come before these children. Now, you black folk can say anything you want. I don't give a damn about what you think about me. Let me tell you, I know what I've done for white folks. Ungraceful. All the craziness. Am I willing to do it for you? Huh? Oh, we'll talk about, well, I, I, I don't want to join the movement. How many of you black folks this summer before it's over going to take your children to Disneyland to see a rat? but have never carried him to King's grave or King's tomb. And had he not died, you wouldn't be welcome in Atlanta, okay? Uh, right. Greg, we're coming up on a break, but let me ask you this. Had, if you had, knowing what you know about what you went through with the movement, how much money you, you, you left on the table, and if you had the chance to do it again, would you do it all? Would you do it again? Twice. Same way? I'd, do it, I'd, do it, I'd do it at a younger age. And when you come back off the break, i tell you why. I'll tell you something that happened to me here. Okay. All right. 800-450-7876. Again, that's 800-450-7876. Speaking to Gregory, we'll take your calls after the traffic and weather update on 1450. W-O-L, where information is power. And thanks for staying with us, folks. Just want to remind you, uh, coming up tomorrow, one of Dick Gregory's friends is going to be here, David Banner. You know, Banner and uh, Nick Cannon and all these young comics, uh, they all want to be like Dick Gregory. He, he won't tell you, but I'll tell you. These, they sit at his feet trying to figure out how he did what he did. And, and you got to understand this. Dick Gregory at the time was the biggest black entertainer there because, you know, they, we had movie stars and athletes and all that, but they didn't cross over. 
Dick Gregory crossed over, and, and for a comic, that's that's incredible. Because usually jokes, you know, white folks don't get black jokes, and black folks don't get white jokes, and you know, some of these comics they use the racial thing as as a stick, you know, f to get laughs. But Greg managed to somehow to, to to entertain both sides equally, and was making big big bucks. And Dr. King called, and he pushed it aside. So, Greg, tell uh, uh, the question I asked you, you I'll, know, I'll, why? I'll, I'll if you do it again. It, it didn't happen like that. You know, <laughs> let me tell you, uh, when I came through, a uh, Negro comic couldn't work a white nightclub. Okay? That was a secret law. Like, they got secret laws now. That's not on paper. Okay? You couldn't work a white nightclub. You could sing. You could dance but you couldn't stand flat forwarded and tell and talk to white folk because then they would know how smart you was. Not Henry Ford, not the Rockefellers, the ordinary white person that go to nightclubs to be entertained would hear you and all that craziness would leave. That's what that was about, okay? I didn't know. I didn't want to be no entertainer. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd never been an athlete or nothing like that. I set the world record in the high school mile, but I didn't. I didn't go out. I didn't know entertainers or athletes in my in my life. So what happened is, so I'm 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 a uh, I made more money than Frank Sinatra at one time. Okay, all right, and I gave mine away because of black folks, and it's different if you come up. If your child wants to be in radio, he heard you. I didn't hear nobody. Huh? Nobody. Okay? And so, so, so what made you think you could well, do it? I, I didn't. I didn't, man. I was the life of the party. People used to be, huh? Skinny. Didn't know where my daddy was. And, they were, and then a friend of mine said to me, he said, man, do you know what? Say, stuff they be saying about you is funny. <laughs> if you can remove yourself from you, <laughs> listen now. And so then I realized that I could go to school and talk about you before you talked about me, and I would get the crowd. And I got so funny, they call me Swift Mouth, man. And the gangs, the juvenile gangs, wasn't in school. Care guns and not. They see me coming, they cross over on the other side of the street. That's what I was doing. I didn't talk about being no car. Listen, call. The funniest laugh you ever heard in your life didn't come from a professional comedian. It came from friends or relatives, okay? The pump of being a comedian is a thing called timing, timing, timing. So one Negro was brought in by Hugh Hefner and changed the whole world. Let me tell you what I mean by that. You look at Will Smith, hmm? had it not been for Hefner, and this black guy, it wouldn't have been a Will Smith, okay? He has made over $9 trillion for the industry, huh? All at once because of that black folks, all the place we had to go and do some little Stuff within the church, the church play. Then all at once, you got producers, huh? You got writers. You got everything now because of one man in this nasty country don't tell you nothing about him or me. I couldn't care less, okay? Okay? I could not care less. Hefner turned the whole thing. When you look at all the, 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 the stuff that came out of one man, Saying to another man, okay, hey, come on, then I'm going to bring you in, okay? And he didn't give me no instructions. Didn't give me no instructions at all, okay? So so, so, so what happened is, so uh, that's, to get back to what you said, my loyalty to black folks, man. Now, I'm, I'm telling you, I can stand on the stage right now and talk for 12 hours. You know why? Because back then... Black folks didn't have no money, so they could come to the, the nightclub and get in free, and a bottle of beer cost 35 cents, and they could sit for three shows. I didn't feel like doing the same show again, so I developed where I could stand there 
and I could stand right now and talk for five hours without taking a drink of water. Okay, I didn't know where I was going. So now let's, let me let me get back to to uh, when the, the, the three uh, civil rights workers was killed in Mississippi. I was in I was in Russia. Me and a, a, a white researcher, Art Stoya, and we went over there because the largest most powerful university in the world is the University of Moscow, but black folk can't go. Now the Chinese was taking black folks from Africa, bringing them to China. On the way back home, someone would take a a, 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 a path going through Russia, and the Russians started recruiting them. But they built a school, the University of Lumumba, for them, okay? And this one black African was dating a white girl, and they found him froze to death. Well, somebody called a friend of mine and told me, so I said, okay, let's go over. Let's go over. I don't have to call nobody to get no money. And if I need this time, I could make 20 phone calls. I had one of the richest white boys in New York City, you know, uh, Joe Glacier. Powerful, powerful. Uh, company here with entertainers. And when I see this big and I came to New York and he said to me, he said, go out there and break a leg. And I said, tell your mama to break a leg. Now, why did I say that? There's no way you can tell me to break a leg and I can make something good out of that. Did you hear what I just said? Break a leg, there's no way you can fix that. So then I started saying, wait a minute, let me see where this came from. And when we started looking at it, it came out of Budapest. When Budapest was the center of gravity, the hottest entertainers on planet Earth was ballerinas. So if your daughter was a ballerina and my daughter was an understudy, the only way my daughter could get her job is she'd break her leg, huh? So y'all better be careful while y'all walk around saying something just because white folks said it. And, and so then, so now I go to Russia, me and my man. And we're going to demonstrate in Moscow Square about the racism. America don't talk about racism because we as racist as they are. France don't talk about racism, huh? And so we go over there and I meet with a guy from the either AP or the UP. And, uh, and I said, here's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to give you the exclusive on it, but I need you to make me some signs. And so we had the signs made. And the guy came back in the, in the morning, and we was going to Red Square and protest, okay? Now, the guy told me, he says, an awful thing just happened uh, in, uh, in Mississippi. Say three whites, so two whites and one black civil rights worker is missing. Now, how I look over there in Russia, Red Square, protesting how they treating blacks, and this story is breaking. So we canceled it. I told Art, I said, get on the phone and get us a charter plane in here. I rented a plane from Moscow all the way to New York. We got off the plane, and with the time difference at 8 o'clock that night, we were in Mississippi, and I was talking to Sheriff Rayner. And I said, let me tell you something, you cracker, you, you going to jail for this, okay? I know you did. I don't look at it. I don't know where you smell. I know you did. And then I called Hefner. And I said, man, would you call my wife and slide $25,000 into the bank, and then she'll get it back to you tomorrow evening. So he did that. I held a press conference. I want you to hear this good. And I put up $25,000 reward. Now, well, you folks mess up when you put up a reward. If I ain't got no money and you put up a $100,000 reward, but I can't get it till the trial is over, no. You need to put up $10,000 for information that can lead. And then $100,000, you'd be surprised how many people going to come out and tell you information of things they find when they know they can stand a chance of getting it now. So I put up $25,000 reward for the rest of conviction of information leading to what happened. Now, I didn't know at that time 
months gone past and nobody could find them. Okay? So so here's what I didn't know. Up until that day that I put the twenty five thousand the FBI in this history had never put up reward money. Did you hear what I just said, Cole? Yep. Because of the twenty five thousand, the FBI put up thirty thousand dollars. Reward. First time. Well, the white folks that wanted to get the money, not only did they give the information to the FBI, they also gave it to me. They also gave it to me. The FBI didn't know they gave it to me. So I'm waiting for the FBI because that's their job. I want to get involved with no murder. And nothing happened, and nothing happened, and nothing happened. And then one day, I'm on my way to Hawaii, and I hold a press conference. And I said to, to President Johnson, I said, President Johnson, uh, here's what we got. If those bodies is not found by 12 o'clock noon tomorrow, I'm going to come back to America and go down there with 10 people with shovels and go under the by dock and dig them up. And when I say that, they knew I knew where they were. Hmm? And that night, the news broke. They found them. That's what that's what I get out of this. Now, before we move from this here, let me tell you, uh, uh, my play, Joe Martin, called Turn Me Loose. Right. The biggest thing on off Broadway. Now, if you don't understand Broadway, and why should you? If you don't understand Broadway, New York is the number one business center in the world. And so you got a company call and you bring in people in from all over the world that you have to, you know, sell your product to around the world. That's why you can have a bad football team or bad basketball team and you can fill the arena because 80% of those tickets is bought by 10 conglomerates that make their living on selling these tickets to companies so you can give them and they come there free. The restaurants are free and everything. So that's how it works, right? So so they said, well, look, we'd like to take you to Broadway. And I said, hey, okay. And here's the law. I didn't say, here's the law. Here's what we'll do. We will, you all write it. I'm not a writer. Hmm? I know nothing about writing plays or nothing. So I'm going to give you a carte blanche. Hmm? Give you a carte blanche. You write it. I'm All right, Greg, hang on a sec. We've got to take a quick break here. We want to hear about the play that's now on Off-Broadway in New York. 800-450-7876. Terry in Columbus also wants to speak to you. Take your calls for Dick Gregory next on 1450. W-O-L, where information is power. Thank you for staying with us, folks. I guess the social activist Dick Gregory, and whenever Greg's on, you always learn something. It's amazing. 800-450-7876. And I'm going to call to speak to him. We're going to talk about Sadie's death as well. And Terry will speak with Terry as well. But Greg, I'm going to let you finish up what you were saying before we left for the break. Okay, so what happened is uh, I told them, I said, I know nothing about no plays. I ain't never wrote a play. I ain't never wrote a movie. So here's the conditions we will do it. We will sign a contract, okay? And X amount of money up front, which was chump change. They didn't know. They got to go out and raise $50 million. Hmm? And then at the end of the year, or two years, if you, nothing happens, you want the right to end, and you do it. I don't have nothing to do with it. Here's what I want to do. After you all finish writing it, okay, I'll let two of my children look at it. If there's anything in there a derogatory about a group of people or a race of people, then you lose the right. Now, I'm not talking about something derogatory about Hitler or something like that. I'm talking about slavery and racism and something like that. That was the deal we made. Now, the strange thing is when they get ready to have the reviews before the play open, mm-hmm. I couldn't come see it because one of the few times in the history of America there's a play on off Broadway or Broadway that uh, uh, the person they're doing about is alive. 
So now I know who's playing me. I didn't know that nobody was there. And so for me to go into the to play and people seeing him and see Dick Gregory, naturally they don't look at Dick Gregory. So I didn't think that would be right for him. So I said, uh, two of my children will come and look at it. They'll come back and bring me the review. And then y'all go with it. That's y'all's business, huh? I get on 747s every day. I don't know how to fly them. I don't know nothing about it. So how I'm going to snoop in. And that's what I did. Now the next thing now is opening up. And John Legend, I mean, the, the people that that was in that, uh, putting that together, John Legend, that I didn't know until I started looking at his wife, make more money than him. I didn't, I, well, why would I know anything about those folks? Huh? And so then they, they, uh, they got the brother, Joe Morgan. And I never watched TV. So I have time to watch TV. I'm traveling. And so the word started getting back. That play opened up. And let me tell you, the New York Times, everybody, people come in from all over the world. To see this, hmm? to see this. Now, let me cut it short. And now they're getting ready to go on Broadway. And that they're telling me now that from the reviews, now, we was in a room with 260 people. Now they got to go to one with three to 6,000. So everything got to change. The acoustics got to change. The electrical engineers got to change. But when it comes out, it will be worldwide, and they said it will last for 25 years, and you guaranteed to make $10,000 a day for the rest of your life. There's a universal God up there that takes care of you. Huh? Okay, did you hear what I just said, Cole? That takes care of you. Uh, Bert Lee, one of my good friends, when I went to Iran, because I know that was a CIA operation, and I told Lil, I said, you probably have to take the children out of private school because I don't know when I'll be back. And so I get back, and I see Bert Lee at the King. That's before the King holiday was real. You see, you black men and women now will go to war and die for this nasty, vicious, insane country, but you won't do it for you. Talk about your children. They don't care nothing about your children or care nothing about you, okay? Well, somewhere, I don't know where it comes from, somewhere there was something inside of me that said, if I have to die, nobody wants to die. I didn't have no money before them black folks come and listen to me, and I end up being one of the funniest cats in the history of the planet. Oh, my stuff, because white folks didn't make me. White folks wasn't sitting in the audience watching me for nothing. And so all at once now, there's nothing. Uh, uh, Bert Lee, the late Bert Lee, the first black cat to own a, a, a professional basketball, the, the, the Nuggets. And so we sitting on stand, and I said, Bert, and I, need, I need about $20,000. It went to bed. I need $20,000. And so he pulled out his checkbook and wrote a check for $30,000. Okay. While we at the festivities in Atlanta, uh, uh, one of the civil rights movement members got beat up in Forsyth County. And so he ran in with blood all over and ran up on the stage. And he told everybody there what happened. He said, we're going back in two weeks. We got to raise some money. <laughs> I gave him the check. Okay. And just when I got ready to call Lil after the, the thing was over and tell her, I gave the money uh, away. And so we, you know, and so all at once now, Bert said, there were no cell phones in. And Bert said, did you need some more? I said, no, man, I just gave that. He was there and he saw me give him the check. Hmm? So he wrote me another check for $50,000. Huh? That's what happened when you are pure. Huh? When you are out there working with no hidden agendas, okay? And so that's your answer to you, Paul. I've got 10 children 
huh? Ten children, okay? All of them went to college. Two of them got PhDs. All of them got good jobs. Hmm? All of them got good jobs. I got one daughter, my oldest daughter. She she got two PhDs from the London School of Economics. I made them all go to black schools, man. All go to black schools. Huh? Her I had a problem because she was the best girls basketball player in the state of Massachusetts. The best. Mm. And at that time, that Title Nine hadn't gone through. So boys, girls probably didn't have a basketball team. So I had to send her to a white school. It just broke my heart. Broke my heart. <laughs> and one day, I get a call, and uh, uh, the coach of LSU, he calls me and he says, uh, Dick, Dick, man, I can tell you how much I love you. I sure me enjoy talking to you. He said, well, there's a, there's a guy coming out of high school. Uh, his name is, is Shaq. And I swear to you, I think if you called his mother, I could get him. And I did. And I did. And he went there to LSU. Coach was so beautiful, man. He told him, he said, don't stay here no longer because you could get into it. The coach wasn't worried about this player taking them to a championship. And so that was my relationship with Shaq. And then I sent my daughter there. She had problems. She'd never been in the South. And and, and she went to this, this, this girl's team with this old, dried-up, prunish-looking white woman. That was the best thing ever hit girls' basketball. And she found out what the South was about. And so I called uh, Dale Brown. And I... Uh, I, I, I sent her there. And then she said, well, now that I've gone to all these white schools, what do you think I should do now that I'm graduating? I said, well, since you're so smart, why don't you go to the London School of Economics and major in sex harassment? And she said, where is that? <laughs> Three weeks later, Lil called and said, you've been talking to Michelle? I said, yeah, about what? She said she just got accepted at the London School of Economics. So I got called her. How did you, you get accepted? And listen to what this girl said. She wrote a little letter. Said, My name is Michelle Gregory. And I'm my fourth year in college. And all four years I got straight A's. But my last two years, the A's are stronger than my first two years because I was interested in basketball. The last two years, I wasn't interested. So although they show A and A plus, both are strong. And guess on that letter? They got it, they put it in. She and majored. They, I was going to say, Greg, that's a hard school to get in. It's harder than Harvard. No, oh, that's what they say. It ain't nothing hard. <laughs> that's where the white boy boo. <laughs> you know, look, don't nobody go to Harvard and deal with a fool. The richest people in the world don't send no children over here to go to school. Huh? Where Prince Charles and them go to school, huh? But that's a game they play, huh? So anyway, here's what happened. So, so now, because nobody had ever had a PhD in that field, that she uh, took her eight years, okay? Because you you cut me a new trail. So right now, if she came and handled a case for you. She's not a lawyer. If she was one of the advisors in the case for you, they can't bring nobody else in because this old white boy protocol, she's the only authority on the planet because nobody else have a degree in that field. Now, that's why I've been blessed. You're right. Well, hold that thought right there because we've got to take our last look at the traffic and weather. we got some folks who want to speak to you and also some brothers at the Clippers Barbershop in Meriden, Connecticut are listening. They want to shout out to them. 800-450-7876. You two can speak to Dick Gregory. We'll take your calls after the traffic and weather together on 1450. W-O-L, where information is power. And thank you for staying with us. And I guess social activist Dick Gregory and a bunch of folks that uh, wanted to speak to you, Greg. You ready to take some calls? Okay. 
Okay, yeah, in, in one second. And then after we finish the takeoff show, we, we get back to New York with, with the, the great Marcus Garvey, and then we take some more calls. But what happened is, is see, I, I watch the politicians. I watch Kennedy and know he ain't no good. Uh, all of them. But you black folks believe what you want to believe, and the universe will pay off. Let me tell you what happened. When the black, when, when the Democrats control the Senate and the Congress, they go to many of these Negroes, and they give them money. They didn't have to give it to them. We, we vote that way. But here's how the universe works. So instead of them asking for $200 million in X amount of money for the black press, okay? They didn't. None of them. And because of no good Democrat thugs got a bunch of pimps out there and a handful of good brothers and sisters that was working, but because of that, it cost them almost two trillion dollars, cause losing the Senate and the Congress. Hmm? Your money bag is not there no more. That's the punishment they got. Okay. Now let me just quickly say this to you: with the election coming up now, the 50-year celebration of the Voting Rights Bill. So, call if you was 30 years old then, huh? You'd be 80 now, okay? Now, what nobody's doing is saying, well, wait a minute, 80 years old, I'm, I'm 85, huh? And so I go to the toilet every five minutes, hmm? So I ain't got time to stand in no line. Sometimes I got to call Lil and ask the thing from my memory, okay? Do you know how many black folks? Now I messed up all the they thought they wouldn't vote it. Tell me, white folks die because they tried. White folks, too, I don't know about that. Die because they thought they didn't take their medicine this morning and they did, or die because they did take their medicine and they didn't and keep forgetting. So now, if you really care about me and you want me to vote, I ain't no damn thing. Huh? I'm one of the most powerful human. I'm talking about black folks. So then you get buses. You make them crackers pay for the buses with toilets in them. Huh? And the coal, you make them pay for But You got old black folks, men and women, and their health is bad. And I got to stand in line. I got black folks out here that lost their driver's license because of their sight. And y'all so busy with your thug filthy self. And all of you pay for it. Okay? All of you would pay for it. I go into a restaurant not too long ago and saw these old black women and white women waiting tables at 3 o'clock in the morning and think about many of you dogs out there living good. And because of that, they got to, then they got to run home and put the children together and get them ready for school. There's a universal God. I ain't talking about the Baptist church, the Catholic church. Okay? Call. Uh, I met your son. Uh, Many years ago, let's say he was a, one of the best football players at, 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 at the university. And let's say you've been a Muslim all your life. Now, I don't know what religion you are. I'm just using this. The one thing I know that you will not let him do is eat pork. Am I right? Right. Whether it were or not, no pigs, no. <laughs> but once he gets to be one of the great football players, you'll let him play football. Ain't that thing called a pig skin, huh? That's right. <laughs> but he can catch that, huh? Yeah, he can't eat a pork, but he can play with a pig. <laughs> huh? That's not, that's not, that's the silliness we're talking about, and so and and and, 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 and and so consequently, when we look at the power, we sit there and talk about the power of this, the power of that, the power of this, huh? The power of this, the power of that. We ain't got no power until you put a coalition together, huh? When the Minister Farrakhan that last March talking about boycott, you can't boycott Christmas two months before Christmas. The big sales come in July. People have already bought their car. You call for it now. Huh? And those of you listen don't have to wait for some leader to call. You get on the phone and call your friends. Huh? 
They said there'll be no Christmas. Just you and them. And then things will start happening. The first thing will happen is the black folks that couldn't afford Christmas. I don't know when you, you get another economic brother on, let him or sister, let him tell you about the economy that exists right now is as worse than it was in 1949. Okay, they ain't going to tell you that. And the only way you're going to hear it is on a show like this. So anyway, when when uh, they cut off, I kept asking questions. Uh, the, the one date I could never get out of my head was May uh, the 17th. Uh, 1954, that was the school bill that the Supreme Court passed, okay? That day will always be with me. And I kept saying, wait a minute, Topeka, Kansas? I mean, black folks been on them to Topeka, Kansas. Jesus, is that my right? What, what, wait a minute, hold it. How come it wasn't Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, huh? And then I found out from the research, that Thurgood Marshall was a thug agent for Hoover. And they made a deal with them Southern tramps that we'll put it up there so we won't have to go through the rest of our life with that stamp. Now, what you need to do is have the the, 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 the major lawyer who you have on the show all the time, and if he hadn't mentioned to it, he'll tell you about the two black lawyers in Alabama that had a case going up the Supreme Court, and they would have to take it on their merits. You hear me? On the merits. And because of that thug punk who all y'all love because you ain't nothing, he wasn't nothing, you take anything anybody tells you, okay? Now think about if that was your children. They wasn't brothers. Something that will be here as long as there's a planet. People will talk about that, and they missed it because some punk. And then the family said, well, he was doing this for Hoover to prove to him that it wasn't no comments in the city. Well, how many people died because of that crap he was turning in, okay? And his name will come down off the airport because you got some young folks coming through. I hear him in my house, okay? That's not going to tolerate it. And so what I'm saying is, so all of this here, so then Kennedy made a deal. Kennedy made a deal. Y'all love anybody, huh? Anybody, huh? And so he made a deal with the South that he would cut the food stamps off in Mississippi to stop the the, the black folk from registering to vote. Huh? I get a call. I said I'll pick it up. So every two weeks, I not only bought but went planes and trucks and threw seven tons of food to Mississippi every two weeks. Okay. Now, the first Christmas, we had Christmas for Mississippi. I bought 20,000 turkeys and flew them into Mississippi. And the State Department got upset and said he's getting so much publicity, he's embarrassing us. And they stopped it. That's what I did out of it. Nothing else. I get to say thanks to black folks. I get to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And so I just say, you know, and then we'll go back to go to the phone and we'll get to the brother Marcus Garvey. But I had a strange thing happen to me. This is who. I had somebody, I was at the Hungry Eye, and I was closing that night. And I see the Secret Service, and they said, somebody needs to see you, but uh, we have to come through the back door. And so I go back, and they come through. It's Adam Stevenson. He hadn't shaved. They said, I need to talk to you, uh, Dick. He said, uh, he, was, he was a secretary he was of the U.N. He was our ambassador to the U.N. And he said, on next week, I'm going to announce the cause of the war that I'm stepping down. And I have to get on the plane because i got to go to you tonight. When are you going to be back? I said, I'll be back East Monday. He said, well, we'll meet Monday evening. I'll be coming back from London Monday evening. Okay? And I just thought that stuff so bad, the way he looked. And, and so that Monday, he was walking out of the U.S. Embassy in London, and a cameraman said, excuse me, Mr. Stevenson, can I take a picture of it? And he fell dead. That's the kind of stuff they got. Okay? 
that's the kind of stuff they got. And because the position that I'm in, the way I spent my money all over the world, all over the world, people bring me information. And I've got the resources and the finances to check it out and make sure that the government sending me some tricks. And finally, before we get into that, that other piece real quick, the government gave me the worst form of cancer you could have. Hmm? The worst form you could have. Then my son called me and he said, Dad, uh, uh, the people that, here's how the universe works. He's going to give me a uh, x-ray. My hernias I've had since I was a little boy. And the x-ray machine didn't work. So he said, well, here, I'm here at the hospital. It don't cost nothing. So he give me a, a MRI. Now, he looks at the hernia. He said, yeah, that's what I thought, da, da, da. Two weeks later, the people that serviced the hospital, Flint Goodwood, and make the MRIs, they came by to check out the machines. and said, oh, I understand you had a celebrity here a couple of weeks ago. So, yeah, they're good. So can we see the pictures? All right, hold that thought right there, Gray. We're going to take this quick break. 800-450-7876. Hate to break it like that, but we take your calls next on 1450. WOL, where information is power. And I give a staying with us, I guess, the social activist Dick Gregory, telling us a story about how he got uh, afflicted with cancer. Greg, I'm going to let you uh, conclude the story, and then we'll take some calls for you. Okay, so uh, so I found out that I had one of the worst forms of cancer. My son said, hey, let me just tell you one thing. When I came by here and took those tests for this hernia, I had just walked 10 miles in Rock Creek Park. So whatever it was, you know, they had just gave it to me. Okay. So now I uh, I tell them, I said, don't tell. We get the report from the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, but I said, don't put my name on it because they're government. And they would say, oh, it was a mistake made. So when he came back, so I said, now don't show this to your mother until after your sister get married. So after that, I got the wedding, I showed her, and she started crying. How could they do this? I said, you crazy? You think I'm leaving you back here, my money? And, and for your high school sweetheart, you your mind, I'm not going nowhere. Now, you walk out of this storm house and stop crying to come back, or I'm getting out of here. I don't come here to see you blimping and all that craziness. And so then I went out to the back of the farm, back of the farm, and I said a prayer. Not to the Catholic Church. The Pope was here uh, six months ago, and he got sciatical so bad he couldn't hardly walk. So why I want him to wash my feet? Hmm? Y'all crazy? Hmm? So Queen Elizabeth make $360 million every 24 hours, just interest on her money. And the same universal God that made her hand made a welfare mother's hand. Huh? So anyway, uh, now I go in the back and I pray to the real God. Huh? God. Ain't nothing mystical. God means power. That's why they can call the mob the Godfather. Hmm? And nobody complains. God ain't got nothing to do with universal law. And so I looked up at today, champ. Uh, I know there's, uh, I know you're busy. you got all things you got to run the whole universe. <laughs> but there are some black folks that deserve cancer, but I'm not one of them. Now, if you need me to write you a list of 12 Negroes that deserve it, I will do that. And if you need something close to the house, I will put their names on it, too. Then I looked at me, and I said, Cancer, I can't see you. I don't know you. Let me tell you something. I'm going to give you three days to get out of me, and then after that, I'm going to roll on you. Just like that. Hmm? Then I came back to D.C. and I called Joe Madison and told him what had happened. And Joe Madison mentioned it on his show. Huh? And three days later, the white dude called Joe, got my number and called me. And this Dr. Krishna said, I heard Joe talking about it. Said, there's a water in El Salvador. Five days. Five days. These things in your body can be wiped out. And so five days later, I came back on a good friend of mine, Steve Jackson, whose daddy invented nuclear medicine at Cedar Sinai. And when I told him about it, I, would, I didn't need him to help me. 
uh, sent him a copy. He sent it to his father, who was, was retired now, and he cried. He said, man, you got about six weeks to live. So I came out there to do something. And while I was there, uh, I went by the sideline, and the great black doctor, Keith Black, talked with him, took a nuclear test, and uh so we need to talk. I said, well, it's not the holiday. I, I talk when I come back. And I left him, and I went and got the treatment. And I came back and showed him the test. He started crying. He said, we need to close this hospital down and follow you. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is what happens. The church is cool, but the church ain't made your knee. The church ain't made your lung. Huh? So when you know who the real force comes from, you have to give up nothing. Just understand what's real and what's not real. And so consequently, uh, the other day, I don't know if I told you, Carl, but I'll send you the copy. The doctor told me I was having trouble with my foot. And I go in, and, and my son is probably one of the, the best chiropractors on the planet. So he just made a phone call, said, go see Dr. Stones. So I go in, they take some tests. They call him and say, wow, man, he's anemic. Wow. So I go by and the guy said, God, man, look at this here. He said, do, 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 do you been bleeding? I said, not that I know of. He said, you're not getting nothing up to you. I said, not that I know of. So he said, well, I'm going to send you to this specialist and give you a sound. And then I got there, and when he looked at my, my stuff, he said, well, your, your, your stuff look better than mine. And then they sent me to get uh, to the Washington Hospital in, uh, in D.C. to get a, uh, what do they call it, uh, <laughs> uh, when you go look up in your bladder and your stomach and everything. Uh, anyway, I think of the name of it. So I go there, and they say, now you can't drive. So I had my daughter drive me. And then they put you to sleep. And when I woke up cold, I thought I had died and went to heaven. Okay, I'm born October the 12th, 1932. And the doctors were standing around. They said, we were just waiting on you to wake up. They said, uh, you have a colon the age of a 25-year-old man. Hmm? I said, I've been here X amount of years. We've never seen nothing like this. That's the universe, huh? You worry about nothing when you know what the real thing is. So I ain't never had to worry about nothing. I didn't know King that well. See, a lot of people said, no, I would go down when King had an accident and we knew we could die. Huh? I didn't hang out with them folks, man. No, that, was, that was King stuff. I, I said, whenever you ready, call me. And then my wife started going. If you called me and I couldn't go, she would go. She spent as much time in jail as I did. It ain't about these children. Huh? It's about liberating black folks where y'all can talk all you crap you want. And you better get ready for what's fixing to happen. Huh? And if you can find how to eat to live and interpret it, you might be around. And those of y'all, that, 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 that movie, just out there, you better run and see it quick, called Purge. It's about this election. And when you go there, you see who Hillary is, and you see who Trump is, and you see bodies laying all over the street, okay? And so, again, I just said, Carl, just thank you. I had no idea we would go this way. we we'll take some calls, all and right. then before we get off, we'll, I'll, I'll tell you my feelings about Marcus Garvey. 800-450-7876. Terry's been on for a while on line one. Call us from Columbus, Ohio. Terry, you're on with Dick Gregory. Dick, it's always an honor to talk to you. Uh, had a chance to speak to you the uh, last three or four times you appeared on the show. God bless you, brother. God bless you, too. Uh, when you speak about the games that they play, you know, I know you've been on the forefront for a long time, and uh, I have two questions for you about that. Uh, when you were t- talking about Kennedy and he didn't die in Dallas, he was a vegetable and some of the other things that, that you have exposed over the years, have you ever felt like your your safety was um, in danger, you or <laughs> or your children? No, let me tell you this: when you go to war, right? Mm-hmm. And that white boy tell you take that hill. Do you think about your children? I don't. I think about what that cracker told me to do. 
I feel the same way about black folks. You know what it's like, man, when black folks put me in a position. I mean, you a little boy, you ever asked your mother or father for a wagon for your birthday? Yes, sir. Okay, I didn't have to do that. They don't make wagons for birthdays, huh? They don't make none of that stuff for birthdays. It's poor black folks and white folks have to have a reason. Anything my children asked for, they had it that day or the next day, huh? I didn't do that. That's what black folks did for me by putting me in a position, huh? Get what for Christmas? Get it now. Wake up one day, your neck is swollen, and your mother and father see the glands is messed up, and you got to wait for payday. I didn't have to do that with my children. They had a problem. That day, they would be at the doctor. If the specialist was in you, they'd be on the plane. That's what black folks did for me. And that's the honor I give the universe because of that. So to answer your question, no, I didn't want to talk about it. No shape, form, or fashion. None. Okay, the, the second question I have for you, and, and the final one, as a gentleman on YouTube, very insightful information, and I know you've been around for a long time, so I want to you know, know uh, your insight on it. He breaks down a lot of the things that we see that happens, whether it's sports, elections, people dying, he equates all this stuff to, like, numerology and geometry. And, uh, excuse me, it's called gematria. And I wanted to know, when you talk about the games that they play, does this kind of coincide with that, you know, as far as who the Super Bowl winner is going to be? Like, even Cam Newton came out recently and said that racism doesn't exist in America anymore. And then he, last year in the Super Bowl, it's like he fumbled the ball and didn't even jump to try to get it, you know, it's like he just threw the Super Bowl last year. Yeah, what well, they do it all the time. Let me, let me ask you this here. How many powerful black or white athletes do you know that ends up with a major company? Huh? You know any? Yeah. That's a glamour thing. The, 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 the damn Olympic Games, you know what the Olympic Games is about? Do you have any children, though? No, I don't, sir. Okay, let's say you had three, right? Mm -hmm. Now, at what age would you let the government train them to get them ready to fight a war? From the time they're four to the time they're 18. At what, what, what age would you let the government start training them to fight war? All right, hold that thought right there, Terry. I'll let you respond on the other side. We're going to take a quick break. 800-450-7876. Speak to Dick Gregory. Ticket calls next on 1450. WOL, where information is power. And thanks for staying with us, folks. Just want to remind you, coming up tomorrow, David Banner, the actor, rapper, turned activist, is going to be with us. So tell your friends to keep it locked right here on 1450 WOL. Let's go back to Terry in Columbus. Uh, guys, if you can keep your answers short, got a bunch of folks got questions okay. for Greg. Terry, Perry. your response. Uh, I will hope I will have the moral courage not to let them train them at nothing. Okay. Now, you said the Olympics? You watched the Olympics? Yeah, yes, sir. That's the bill, folks, for war. Okay? That's mm -hmm. why now that women's integrated, now you see more women's sport. War is about breathing. <laughs> That's what it's about. That's how tricky they are. So they don't have to get your permission. All they got to do is like you. In a day, you like in sports, and you running, and you throwing the javelins, and you doing all that. That's to get you ready for war games. Okay. All right. Uh, Thanks, Terry. Eight hundred four five zero seven eight seven six. Fixico's calling us from LA. He's on line three. Fixico, you have a question for Dick Gregory? And Father Gregory, I am an American. I am an American Maroon descendant who has been invited by the United States. Oh, repeat that real quick. I am a maroon descendant. Maroon. But, but you say I am a descendant of an event who I have been invited by the United States Forestry Service to give a peace ceremony at the bicentennial of the massacre, massacre of the 300 Fort Negro victims. Father Gregory, 
Will you or your area representative please attend a regular No, 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 wait, hey, ho, 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 wait, 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 let me be honest with you. Tell me, I get in touch with me and want me to come someplace. Not at all, huh? I understand what you're saying. That's when the brother asked me, I'm not scared, I'm not scared, because I don't go any place that somebody called me. If you said, let's go to the restaurant, I said, who's going to name the restaurant? See, I know what they do. Let me, let me just say this to you, dear. The night the Malaysian airline disappeared, I knew the right person to call. I said, where, where y'all taking that? And now you can Google this. Malaysian Airlines Flight 7370 redirected to Diego Garcia. Okay. This is a game they play. But they don't need to play a game with all them trillions of dollars of stuff we have in outer space. Thing could disappear and I stuff up there wouldn't see it. That ain't their fault. That's your fault. Huh? A Greyhound bus can't disappear. Huh? <laughs> Will you, will you recognize the Fort Negro event, Father Gregory? Baby, don't waste my time, please. All right? Respect me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, all right. Thanks, Nicole. Just get, reach out on, on Facebook, and you can cause we got to keep running. we got a bunch of folks who want to speak to Greg. 800-450-7876. Charles is calling us on line two. Charles come from the district. Charles, down with Dick Gregory. Hey, Bubba. Bubba Dick Gregory calling up from Great Show. Bubba Dick Gregory, I had a chance to see Joe Morton. In your uh, in your play, Turn Me Loose, and he did an outstanding job. So yes, I want to congratulate you. you both on that. Um, so my question to you is as follows: So the word on the street is that Hillary Clinton is sick. She got lesions in her mouth. She can barely stand up. She got a neurological disorder. Do you have any intel on the community? You know, for the community on that. And then secondly, if I did, I wouldn't tell you on the radio. Well, okay, and then secondly, I mean, where did you hear it? Oh, I, I heard it through sources. You know, I, 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 okay, and the sources you got you trust? Yeah, I do. I do. Okay. I trust those sources. Well, but I don't trust no source more than I trust you. Well, I know let, me, let me just say this here. Let yes, me sir. say this to you. Sometime today after the show was over, Google New York Times story, 1.5 million black men is missing, okay? Yes, sir. All right? That's more than Hillary. 1.5 million black men are missing, and they got them on the planet right up over us. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And they're yes, taking sir. their organs, and they're doing all kinds of things. Okay? My, and then my, when my you get second, through. Yes. My, my second question to you is, last night we saw something unprecedented. We saw Trump, um, someone already extend an olive branch to the, to the black community and slamming the Democratic Party for their dismal failures within the black community, how they control all these black cities all over America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yes. So what's your now, let, me say, let, let me say this to you. Yes, sir. One day, just meditate and think about the Jews in Germany. Yes, sir. The one thing we can say about them, they wasn't stupid enough to believe they was part of Germany. Hitler mm. didn't give a damn about them, and Hitler didn't let them know a damn thing they was going to do. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Now, yes, watch sir. this. Now, here, watch this. The best speech he ever made was last night, but it wasn't for you. It was to tell all them white folks who's racist and don't want to be, you can vote for me. Listen to what I'm going to say to these Negroes. Huh? That's who the speech was for, not for you. Huh? Yes, sir. Not for you at all. And when you get to look at that stuff, it's not for your benefit. We black folk go to war, and we don't decide when the war is going to start or when it's going to end. Huh? This is not yes, for you. This ain't your business. Okay? Love you, Bobby Dick. Love you, Bobby Dick. Thank you, baby. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Charles. 800-450-7876. Apollo's reaching out to us on line five. Also calling from the district. Apollo, I'm with Dick Gregory. Apollo, God bless you. Peace. Hi. Thank you for God's blessing, and thank you for taking my call. I have one quick question, and I have one quick comment, if I can make the comment. But yeah. I'm not allowed to make the comment regarding the Carl Nelson show. It's okay. But my quick question is, many times I've heard you speak about different celebrities who you would say, this person is a government agent, be it they're good Marshall or Farrakhan, whoever it was. I and, know that Farrakhan. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, 
forgive me. I'm, I'm, I'm just throwing out names at random, and I'm a new listener to WOL, and so I don't always have the facts, but I've known many times you said that certain black celebrities uh, or individuals were government agents, and I'd be shocked to hear that. When you mentioned the term government agent, could you explain in kind of like a specific term exactly what it means? I, I, I don't let know. Me, let me say this to you. Let me say this, to, was, you, uh, let me say this uh, to you, brother. Let me say this to you real quick. Uh-huh. When I talk, I talk to people. If my mama heard the stuff, she was alive. She called the police for me. I talk to people that know my integrity and know I would die before I would lie to you. Okay, so then I don't have to go around. There's people all over the world. If I want to make a call to the Vatican, I know who to call. Huh? If I sit here and tell you your, 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 your birth certificate is owned by the Vatican, trade it every day on the New York Stock Exchange. Now, you go look it up. All you got to do is Google it huh? and look it up. But I got to sit here and tell you I've lost three researchers murdered. And I'm going to sit here and tell you some of you, I don't care if you do or not. There's enough people out there that might can make a trip and do this and do that, okay? That's all it is, okay? The, 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 the Chicago Tribune, when Hoover sent out a telex to Chicago to kill me, all right? I got the telex from his thug agent, got it in Chicago. Hmm? Chicago Tribune, March the, 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 the 10th. 1987, front page, FBI memo, use mob to kill Gregory. Okay. So I got to sit down and break stuff down. I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not going to waste my time doing that in no shape, form, or fashion. Right. None and Apollo, whatsoever. Apollo, and, and let, me just, let, Marshall, me just, let me just say this here real quick. Open as well. Go ahead. Greg. You can Google this. A black man, Robert Gallo, filed that a United States patent applied for his invention to cure HIV and AIDS virus. The patent number for the invention is 46477773. Now, you call the patent office tomorrow, and they'll give you the same number, okay? Thank you, okay. baby. Uh, thank, thank you, Paula. And, and as far as Thurgood Marshall, that's that's now Freedom of Information released that information. That's that's widely known. Uh, <laughs> Greg, uh, you, you talked about Pan. That brings us Dr. Sabi. Your thoughts on his death? Well, first, first, let me just tell you this real quick. When 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 when, when, when you look at what happened in New York, uh, when when you, you look at one of the fine minds on the planet, and you had his son on, I think it was yesterday. Uh, last week, actually, last week, Monday. Okay. And so, and so, here's a man that they sit him up with the the, the, the sister in New York, uh, uh, Queen Mother Moa. Okay. And back then, everything was segregated: the, the Negro YMCA, the Negro YWCA. Well, I know somebody that ran that, and she used to catch her bringing her bringing folk in with their tricks. Okay, and so then what happened was, boom, they, she set him up, FBI busted him, but they were scared to kill him because of the way black folks felt about him. Huh? That's how I did a telex from the FBI before the FBI gets it, okay? There's a whole lot of law people here, huh? And the brother that just hung up a few minutes ago, you Google, Google, uh, the, the the book Roots. Uh, Alex Haley ain't wrote none of that now. And then you, after you finish that, go and Google the the the, the, the federal judge in upstate New York that brought Alex uh, uh, Murray Fisher and Harry Comander, and the judge say you all. Bring a check in here tomorrow for six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and admit in my court that you stole it, or you're going to jail. Let them white folks tell you, huh? All right. I go out here and do the hard work and give it. It's for the people who know who I am that I would not. And most of the stuff you can do yourself. Okay, once you get it, I, I just told you where to, to Google it, and you let go. And the reason y'all fought for it, you're not going to do nothing. You're not going to do anything. 
but sit around and sell wolf tickets and think somebody did this and somebody did that. And I say what Trump did yesterday wasn't for you, it was for them white folks. That he convinced them if you vote for me, you're not voting for a racist. That's what that speech and one of the best speeches he ever gave, but it wasn't meant for you, okay? Back back to um, uh, Murray Fisher and those fellas. And, and who wrote the autobiography of Malcolm X? Then was it Murray Fisher as well? Yeah, it was there. And 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 when I get the autopsy of Malcolm X, you saw it on TV. They were shooting up. All the bullets in Malcolm was going down. Now the CIA have admitted that they went in the Ottoman ballroom and rented it two weeks, and that's when they set up all all the stuff. Okay. Not, not when- did my, Malcolm know he was being set up when when he was doing the review well, for the book? Well, the only thing I can say is this. Malcolm saw a can of gun, huh? And I knew he was worried. I knew he was scared. And if you know where Malcolm lived, when the news broke that somebody threw a firebomb, and they might act like it was the Nation of Islam, and it burnt the front of his door, Malcolm's house sat about 440 yards from the driveway. So how you going to throw a, a Molotov cocktail? And then they gave the, the license plate and the color of the old old bill that said, all right, get rid of it. This is what this is about, huh? Wow. Greg, we got to leave. <laughs> thank you for that story as well. Got to get out of here. I thank you for joining us thank today. You. All right, folks, uh, we're running late as usual. Stay strong. Stay positive. Stay in the light. We'll see you tomorrow at 4 o'clock right here on 1450. W-O-L, where information is power.